Continuing on with uh, quantifiers, uh, something that we're definitely going to see are uh, existence proofs, where we're required to demonstrate that a certain object exists. And this is really just proving a, sta a quantified statement where that quantifier is an existential quantifier. So let's look at some existence proofs. And these can be kind of interesting. I mean, we've seen very simple ones where we just have to show an example. And so here's an example of one right now. So there exist integers x and y such that the cube of x minus the square of y is equal to 13. And here's a complete proof that this is a true statement. So consider the number x equals 17 and y equals 70. Well, since 17 cubed minus 70 squared is 4,913 4, minus 4,900, that difference is 13, we're done. So why is this sufficient? Well, the statement is just there exists x and y, so that blah happens. So to prove it to be true, we just need to give one example that makes it true, because it's that existential quantifier, there exists. We do not actually, as part of the proof, have to explain how we found that. That's not part of the proof. All we need to do is give the example and demonstrate that it works. Okay? This is an example of a constructive proof. We actually give the example that makes things work. Another example. So there exists an x between 0 and pi over 2. So this is the closed interval between 0 and pi over 2. So all real numbers between 0 and pi over 2. So that cosine of x is equal to x. Now those of you who have taken a standard first year calculus class will recognize this as an intermediate value theorem sort of problem. So let's prove it using that. Okay, so we are proof. Let f of x be the difference of cosine x and x. And then note that f of 0 being cosine of 0, which is 1, minus one, uh, 0, is 1, which is positive. Then f of pi over 2, well, cosine of pi over 2 is 0, so this is just minus pi over 2, which is negative. So because it's positive at one point and negative at another point, and continuous, now we haven't really gone into the full proof that it's continuous, but it's the difference of continuous functions, so it's continuous. So we could do that if we really had to, but we're not going to for this course. But because it's positive here and negative there and continuous, we can apply the intermediate value theorem. And we know that the intermediate value theorem guarantees the existence of a point between 0 and pi over 2 so that f of c is 0. Now, because f of c is 0, we know that cosine of c equals c as required. Okay. Now, I've made sure that the reader knows, hey, I'm citing the intermediate value theorem. I'm making that quite bold here in the proof because we need to pull that result into our proof of this result. Okay, So I'm making sure it's clear to the reader what I'm using. Now, why is this sufficient? Well, to prove this statement, we only need to infer that an example exists. The intermediate value theorem doesn't give us that example. It doesn't tell us what the value of C is but it tells us that it exists. So we don't need to give that example explicitly. So this is an example of a non-constructive proof. We infer that something exists, but we don't tell you what it is. Okay? But it's sufficient to prove the result. So in this way, proofs of existence fall into two broad categories. Constructive proofs in which a specific example is explicitly constructed and verified. Mind you, an explanation of how we found that example isn't required. Okay? All we need to do is say, hey, look, these numbers make it work, like we did in that first example. A non-constructive proof is kind of the opposite of this. The existence is inferred, but the example is not explicitly stated. Now, once we've proved the existence of an object, one tip also frequently wants to prove the uniqueness of that object. So there exists a unique object x, so the p of x. Now, sometimes this is, can be taken to be another sort of quantifier, the unique existential quantifier. But let's just think of it as proving uniqueness on top of existence. Now, a simple way to approach such proofs is to do something like the following. Okay, after we've proved that an object exists, Let's let x and y both be objects that make p of x true. Okay, so let, let's prove that at least one of these exists and then show, then assume that p of x and p of y both make things true. Now, then what we need to do is we need to do stuff, and I'm not going to say what stuff is, that's almost certainly where 
the fun of the proof is, is working out what we would actually do. But then after we've assumed that x and y both make p of x true, we try to show that x has to be equal to y. Because that means as soon as we have what we think might be multiple objects that make p of x true, they all actually have to be the same object. So here's an example of this. The equation ax equals b with a and b real numbers and a non-zero has a unique solution. So first note in our proof that since a is not zero, we can solve the equation by choosing x is b over a. And we know that's a real number because b is a real number, a is a non-zero real number, so their ratio is a real number. Thus, we know a solution exists. Well, now, as the second part of our proof, assume that the numbers R and S both satisfy the equation. Well, hence we know that AR equals B and AS equals B. So we must have, because AR and AS are both equal to the same thing, we must have AR equals AS. And since A isn't a zero, we can divide both sides of this equation by A to just get R equals S. So both these solutions are actually equal. And so the solution we know exists must be unique because all our solutions are actually equal. So that's a simple example of a uniqueness proof. Let's stop there.